there's another layer of turtles, right? Very interesting. Take another layer up. Let's look at, at, at these providers who are using um, common sets of physical infrastructure, chipsets, common sets of hypervisors to deliver their service. Well, prior when Joanna Rakowska and her team at Invisible Things Labs came up with a set of these uh, um, exploits, I said, eh, you know, not that interesting uh, or not that, not that readily exploitable. But when I started thinking about the fact that in cloud we're dealing with, with uh, networks that have 40, 50, 60, 100,000, and as Google, as Google has, even though they don't use virtualization the same way, up to millions of nodes, what happens when I have a common layer that provides all of the multi-tenancy, all of the isolation, and all of the security capabilities to enable service? Well, she's been able to show uh, Zen-based uh, hypervisor DOM0 escalation, where she can essentially own the, uh, the version of parent partition that, that owns the, the uh, would be DOM U or the client's uh, VMs. Uh, VM escapes, blue pilling, inserting one hypervisor under another. So all of the security things that you think you have in place can be completely and transparently um, uh, skirted. Right? Then we've got uh, ultimately bypassing uh, trusted execution technology into its chipsets, which he's shown, SMM attacks, BIOS rootkits. This stuff is, is real. It's, it's able to be weaponized, ultimately. So again, shared infrastructure, shared fiber, um, you know, shared networks, ultimately shared uh, multi-tenancy from the perspective of, of virtualization on a common set of software that by all, by all virtue, even though it's 40-year-old technology, is four or five years old in terms of maturity in deployment, deployment and development. So I know you love here the monoculture word, but it is an absolute reality when it comes to some of these large public, uh, public cloud providers. And it's, it's, it's horrifically frightening. Because the reality is, besides the operating systems that, that run on top of these things, we now have a common set of infrastructure. So whether you're looking at the two big players in this market, what happens when these exploits come to pass? How quickly are, you, are, are your providers going to be able to remedy them? So here's another interesting, we'll go up a level, at another turtle. So here is the community, uh, a set of community AMIs, or virtual machines for lack of a better description, that's available on Amazon that people have created. Windows, Ubuntu, Fedora Core, they're just packages of operating systems and hardware in, a, in what amounts to a VM, right? You download them and you just say, go, deploy. Deploy one of them, deploy 100 of them, right? Do what you want, go. Um, you go to VMware, do the same thing. Here's a Sugar CRM, here's a couple of other packages, virtual appliances that you just basically click download and start deploying. Well, let me ask you a question. When you look at this software, uh, how, do you, how do you know what's in these images? How do you know what process, talking about the SDLC that Andy was talking about, how do you know what is actually running in these things if you're not a code expert, if you don't do source, uh, source review? So in fact, the guys at SensePost presented at Black Hat, have they built an AMI, named it so it would be at the top of the list and made it sexy and attractive looking, and hundreds, I think, hundreds if not thousands of people downloaded the AMI and ran it, right? I could, I could install malware. I could do anything I wanted, and because there's no outbound filtering on some of these networks, it just, you know, ex information exfiltration, uh, you know, free of charge. So uh, here's another interesting thing as we bubble up. Some research was done by Aaron Tromer out of MIT, uh, Harvard actually, I think, and uh, where he did this thing, this, this fantastic set of research that while it may not be weaponizable, it may not be practical in some senses, was able to show, for example, that uh, on Amazon, um, he was able to predict based on brute force loading in an infrastructure that's completely abs uh, abstracted from me, based on uh, essentially being able to look at how, um, in the combination of IP addresses and how ultimately resources are deployed, was able to see where and which physical machine an AMI would be deployed on. But I'm not supposed to know that. So what that gives me is the potential to look at fingerprinting attacks as we move forward that, uh, that says, you know what, if I'm interested in attacking you, then if I can brute force my way into understanding how I'm going to be able to place my AMIs and I put them right next to you and then I find an exploit based on another turtle that allows me to do something nasty to you and I'm in the same physical box, okay, that's bad. Okay, that's bad. Now there may very well be countermeasures to this and I'm sure there are and will be, but the point is, you know, researchers and, and black hats and white hats generally think about these things in abstract terms where operationally the providers don't. And this is a great example, fantastic research. Um, Guy Rosen did, uh, kind of took another um, uh, stab at something very similar, and uh, it's kind of the, uh, the German tank uh, problem from World War II. The Allies wanted to know how many German tanks, how many panzers they had. So they, they, they went through all this analysis and this, you know, they're thinking, how are we going to be able to do this? How are we going to be able to understand um, how they're rolling out the, these numbers of ta uh, the number of tanks? It became a very simple question. They just looked at the number of serial numbers that incremented. Oh, okay, 
Very easy solution. So Guy did something very similar. He noticed that every time an Amazon AMI resource spooled up, it had a resource ID. So at a minimum, what he's able to do is forecast based on a response to anything, traffic, auto scaling, which is the ability to burst up under load. Um, he could tell how many resources were, were loaded in a particular period of time. Now imagine from a fingerprinting perspective, if I'm interested in understanding how a cloud provider responds to attack based on load, based on anything, based on scale, or a customer does, how he set up his auto scaling rules from one AMI to maybe a hundred, doesn't really matter in different availability uh, zones. You know, I start over here, I watch how things ultimately scale, and then maybe I launch targeted attacks while somebody's not looking over here, or I see how they respond. I'm able to better target what it is I'm going to do. Again. There are ways around this, providers, and, and this is maybe a short-term thing, but the point here is that, again, creativity and ingenuity trump this socialist security approach, right? Ultimately, they're always going to be smarter and better people that look at exploiting these holes. So let's take this up a level again. We'll talk about another turtle. Um, a friend of mine, uh, John Oberreed, did a really interesting set of research, this time on VMware. He also did it with, uh, with, with, some, with some Zen stuff, too. But uh, there's a vMotion, which is the ability to take a running image from one part of your network, from one layer to network, and move it across, and then kind of stop this one and start this one without any downtime. Uh, it requires today what amounts to an unencrypted network channel to do it, because it adds overhead. So essentially what they do is they kind of take this image, they bit chunk it, they transfer it over by pieces, and when it's all intact, they go, go. Well, what John was able to do is, um, see that network in the middle? Uh, envision, oh, let's say a shared oh, MPLS network, for example, where he has now access transparently uh, to, those, to those network channels. He was able to take code as he vMotioned it, inject code in, in real time as it transferred, and have code run over here that wasn't running over there with no detection. If that doesn't make you crap your pants, I don't know what will. This was horrific, right? Turtles on turtles on turtles on turtles. I, you know, this stuff is, is, is pretty scary. And you think, oh, well, you know, physical protections, MPLS. You know what? If you combine that with ERNW's work, which is entirely feasible and completely low tech, um, you ought to not react that way. Uh, so we go up a level again. We look at how people are doing research on VM escapes. So the guys at Immunity showed their Cloudburst VM, which essentially, anybody here had any experience with an operating system that was using embedded device drivers in the kernel? Oh, uh, yeah, kind of a bad idea, I think we've decided, right? So some of these uh, virtualization platforms uh, do that, um, sadly. Uh, so in that regard, they're able to essentially abuse virtualized device drivers and, and, you, and end up with uh, VM escapes, being able to get to other VMs or even to the hypervisor themselves. Uh, scary stuff, right? So we're going to leave the infrastructure around now that I've turtled you out there and you should be sufficiently interested and intrigued, and we'll go up a level to, the, to uh, metastructure. So uh, uh, Uncle Dan over here has his, uh, um, you know, everything is a DNS problem, which in many cases it is. Um, so DNS cache poisoning, right? Fantastic set of things. When we talk about trust, uh, I want to talk to Bob, you know, Bob.com. I just trust that with a padlock in my browser that Bob.com is who he says he is. And in fact, it's the certificates, right? It must be true. What could possibly go wrong? So Dan's uh, DNS attacks, you look at ERNW's BGP or Capella and Pilosoft's BGP attacks, like they did the Black Hat, where they re redirected all the ba Black Hat network traffic to New York. Nobody noticed. Uh, or when Pakistan black holed with a more specific route, uh, they didn't like, uh, you know, um, the latest Britney Spears video, so they said, oh, we need to do something about this. Uh, please get rid of YouTube. Sure, I'll inject a slash 24 for all of, uh, for all of um, YouTube, which then routed all of your traffic to Pakistan, um, which, you know, for, for, for YouTube was, was amusing since, uh, you know, as much as I like Bollywood and that sort of thing, uh, eh, didn't really give the desired effect. So then you, you couple that with uh, man in the middle attacks. You couple that then with uh, Moxie Marlin Spike's work with, uh, with SSL TLS. Uh, where he was able to do, in conjunction with, for example, Sodorov stuff with rogue CAs, chain certs, null certificates, where they're able to spoof things for phishing attacks. All of the trust models we have at the, at the metastructure layer, BGP, SSL, DNS, essentially, once you're part of the club, once you're connected to the network, once you're able to announce and inject things like BGP routes, there ain't a hell of a lot you can do to prevent these things. There's response to them, but again, the crusty old protocols never really built in enough authentication and authorization to think about what these attacks, in, very, in some cases very low-tech ways, uh, do. Um, so again, we're relying on all of this stuff still, right? More turtles. So as we go up and we think, well, a lot of this stuff will be fixed if we can just get 
enough APIs uh, and enough interfaces, uh, open or proprietary, to allow me to do this. The reality is that if, you know, when we start looking at the fact that there are literally 13 kind of standard bodies or organizations today working on cloud interfaces, ultimately it will settle down. But what we have now at the level of trying to manage and get visibility into the, 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 uh, the infrastructure layers and the metastructure layers, um,